the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. All right, we're 30 minutes into the U.S. Trading Day on this Friday, September 23rd. Here are the top market stories that we have for you at this hour. It's U.K. tax cuts just crashed the markets. Liz Truss's government outlines a radical tax cut package and more government borrowing. The market's price in a 100 basis point hike from the BOE. Traders race to reprice risk. And we're seeing epic bond market declines. U.K. rates climb as much as 50 basis points, triggering a sell-off in global bond markets. European stocks enter a bear market. Traders rush into the dollar again. And a retest of the June lows. Goldman, the latest strategist to cut its forecast. We try to find some technical levels as investors look to that retest of June lows. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. This has been a really tough week for markets, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. I mean, the, I, I've never seen moves like this before in a bond market. Yeah, I, it, is, it is Friday. We should all be glad it's Friday, I think. A little bit of a moment to pause and maybe think about what is going on here. Uh, I'm looking at a cable rate that is now trading at 110.10. Potential test of 109 uh, imminently. We're at session lows. We're down by 2.23. Uh, Alex, 2.3%. The five-year is epic. I, th this has been a week in which and it's just been a drumbeat of bad news for risk assets. Uh, in the form of the Fed, in the form of the data, in the form of the fiscal event that we just had here in the UK. It has all come together and snowballed, and mm -hmm. that is what we're seeing at the end of the week. Yeah, and, and no one seems to be immune at this point. You are seeing some safety moves, like I mentioned, uh, into the dollar and now in the back end of the bond market. Uh, but even that, you have to think about how you're going to price that if we wind up going to some kind of recession here uh, within the U.S. with the Fed continues to rate cuts, uh, uh, hike rates. But now and today... It really is about the U.K., and I, I'm reading note after note about the characteristics that the U.K. now has with emerging markets and why we're seeing the fervent uh, capital outflows uh, from different assets in the country. Absolutely. Um, the UK, but the U.K. Is, is just front and centre in this today. Other markets have taken centre stage throughout this week. You've got an energy crisis that is evolving in Europe. You've seen what has been happening uh, with Vladimir Putin uh, and his nuclear threats. Uh, you've got, obviously, the Fed in the mix as well and central banks broadly. The amount of tightening we've seen this week uh, has been eye-watering, Alex. So it has been unbelievable to put this all together into a, just a few days and get the kind of market reaction we're getting. I, look at the pound, 110.09. Hmm. We're, 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 we're pushing lower and lower and lower as the day progresses, down 2.25%. Is it time to take profit on that trade? I don't know, but there's certainly notes beginning to float around about that. Look at the UK five-year. A 45 basis point move. This is unbelievable. I, I can't remember seeing these kinds of moves, uh, and we certainly haven't for decades. How does the Bank of England respond to this? The 250, probably a more accurate gauge as to what is happening uh, here in the UK rather than the FTSE 100, down by 2.14%. And that is, that is on a day, there's still some translated earnings effects into that. That is on a day when the currency has gone down in theory you should be valuing even the 250 a little bit more richly because if you have the translated earnings effect in, that should benefit the UK and, in theory, make UK businesses more competitive. And they've got, some big, uh, they've got some big tax gains today. But that's not the way it's playing out here, Alex. Yeah, here in the U.S., Guy, we wanted to highlight as well, I mentioned that June low, right, that 3666 level. We are just about 20, 30 points away from that right now within the S&P. We're off almost a full two percentage points. And as you pointed out, you know, you had the Fed, you had other central banks hiking rates, energy crisis, and then the U.K. was like the icing on the cake for that. Uh, energy is the hardest hit within the S&P as oil really rolls over now. Brent just in the high. 80s. Uh, and I mentioned where the money's going. Um, Bank of America took a look at the data and just through Wednesday, $30 billion moved into cash. You can just imagine then what happened over the last 48 hours. Uh, the 30-year now up by one basis point. Money going into there. The dollar continues to make uh, new highs. You have to, it's like there are no charts for this right now in, in what we're seeing. And how do you catch a falling knife? Uh, and where do you hide out until we settle yeah. up? Well, I hope there are charts because we're about to talk to a technical analyst. So I'm hoping that, that uh, we will find out a little bit maybe uh, as to um, what we can learn about where we're going from that conversation. The risk route certainly intensifying. It has been a snowball, as I say, that has just been gathering momentum and size throughout this week. Here's what I guess have been saying about what we've just seen. The market has been bad. We're very much in flux now. We have weakness across the 
across the world. The animal spirits feel crappy. The global world is slowing. Numerous different headwinds, uh, whether it's around growth. Inflation. Corn inflation is looking sticky. Jeff Litz, Chris, as well as a hawkish Fed. You name it, there's a tremendous number of pressures. The headwinds are too much. There could be further downside. I'm overall bearish on risk. Sentiment and positioning will become so extremely bearish. We're dealing with an uphill battle here. Let's talk about where this leaves us from a technical point of view. I, there's lots of fundamentals to think about here, but at times like this, when you see these very whippy markets and big levels potentially being broken, it's often useful to try and use technical analysis to gauge sentiment and where we are. Richard Ross joining us now, head of technicals uh, over at Evercore, to give us a take on what is happening here. Richard, let's start off and talk about what is happening with the equity markets and the bond markets. Give us an idea of what you're seeing, first of all, in equities. Yeah, well, look, I think I'm seeing what, what most people are seeing, which are some extreme moves across asset classes. And clearly what's driving the action in stocks is the, the clear erosion, these historic moves, if you will, from the top down across both currencies and credit. And here we are testing the lows of the year on the S&P around that 3666 that you alluded to earlier. And the DAX and the CAC, again, flirting with, if not breaking just below those year-to-date lows. So clearly, this is a critical inflection point for global markets. Um, for the S&P, where's the next level of support before we get to the June lows? Is there one? No, I think you're really there. You know, what I've been saying in conversations is that in fast-moving markets like this, there's no real difference technically, and I, I don't mean to be uh, somewhat glib about it, but there's no difference technically between 3693 3666 and, and even 3620. Again, not, not to spend our viewers' money, but only to suggest that we're talking about 20 minutes of price action at this point in a, sort of a historically volatile tape. Richard, just stay with equities for a moment. How low could we go? If you take a step back and look at where the charts are right now, can you make any longer term projection, predictions about the unwind that we're seeing? Where does it ultimately, yeah, I, do you think, take us? Yeah, I apologize. I didn't mean to speak over you there. I, I think what I've been using to help guide me, and, and it certainly hasn't been helping that well, is the longer-term charts. And when you look back at whether it's a long-term weekly chart back to the financial crisis in 08 or a longer-term monthly chart to sort of smooth out some of that volatility, what we see is that remarkably that longer-term trend is still intact. The 200-week comes in around 35.85. The 50-month comes in around 35.25, 35.50. So again, we're with Within about 100, 150 handles here, let's call it three to 500 basis points before we start testing those really critical levels of long-term support. Mm -hmm. My contention is if we're able to hold those levels, then uh, again, while it, it sort of flies in the face of reason, the, the bull market will remain intact if we can hold those levels. And, and again, if we do breach those levels, which have not been breached going back to 2009, then it opens the door to further downside. But that's not my call at this juncture. Okay, so Richard, how much does the two year need to top out for us to not make new lows here um, and to make that June low really the bottom? Yeah, I, I think it's all about interest rates and the dollar, and, and they're two sides of the same coin, no, no pun intended. And what we see in interest rates, again, is a chart that's gone vertical here, um, and, and obviously for good reason or bad reason, if you will, as it pertains to that more hawkish policy, not just here in the U.S., but but on a global basis to try to rein in this, this surge in inflation that we know about. So the key point bringing it back to those yields is that when you stare at the two-year, this is the most overbought in yield that you've ever been, and the chart has gone vertical. So again, we don't stand in the face of a runaway train. You don't catch the falling knife, but we know that things that go straight up and become the most overbought they've ever been have a tendency to come straight down. Let's talk about what is happening in the energy markets. Um, clearly, there is a dollar relationship here, but there's also a demand relationship here as well. Um, talk to me about what you see from a technical point of view outside of the fundamentals. Uh, crude coming down pretty sharply once again today, a fairly big move to the downside. How much further does that have to run? Yeah, I think uh, WTI has been one of the few things have gotten right around here lately with some downside to $65. Look, clearly there's been geopolitical concerns to say the least 
uh, which have kept a bid in the market. Uh, but by the same token, the chart's been eroding for some time, really in almost straight line fashion from that 125, 130 level that we peaked at back in the summer projects measure downside to $65, $70. Again, that stronger dollar is finally coming home to roost in the crude hits. And, and again, clearly the erosion in demand and the rising risks of a recession uh, weighing there as well. So not a lot to hang your hat on from a bullish standpoint as it pertains to crude. And, and of course, fantastically, the Ukrainians making some progress uh, remarkably against the Russians. So I, I think all roads lead to lower WTI prices. Yeah, and I also do wonder, like, how many stop losses have been triggered that need to then, you see other assets and selling off, all that contagion that we worry about and capitulation. Um, Richard, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Charts are so useful on a day like today. Richard Ross of Evercore ISI, thank you very much. So coming up, we'll get more on the sell-off. Is a soft landing now? Nothing more than wishful thinking. What do you do on a day like today? Um, we're going to talk to Chief Investment Strategist at Bull Tick Capital Markets, Catherine Rooney-Vera. This is Bloomberg. A tighter Fed up until now meant higher longer term rates, you know, perhaps, you know, a tighter Fed going forward is going to actually mean lower rates because it means lower long term growth, lower long term inflation. Right now, we have probably one of the highest, you know, exposures to cash and cash like investments that we've had in, in the history of the firm. Probably about 17 percent or so of the portfolio is in cash and cash like investments. And I think, you know, it, it's a lot, but it gives you a lot of dry powder. It gives you a lot of safety. And again, you also get to capitalize on these higher rates. Uh, that the Fed is providing us. That was Dan Suzuki, a deputy CIO at Richard Bernstein Advisors, talking about his firm's cash, cash allocation, which I mentioned before, $30 billion of inflows just through Wednesday of this week. So where do you find safety? Joining us now for her take, Catherine Rooney-Vera, chief investment strategist for Bull Tick Capital Markets. Catherine, always good to see you. What do you do on a day like today? I think you have to have already been positioned in value over growth, have a healthy cash position, um, definitely have some structured products that limits your downside, also limits your upside, but they're products that we've been um, touting to our clients for some time and able to execute. Um, so certainly, you know, the cash and value, defensives, we're entering a recession. The Fed is hiking into a recessionary environment. So we do need to have positions that can historically outperform in very difficult times like this. Catherine, how, what would persuade you to, to use the cash? I, I'm, what I'm wondering is if we are, we are reaching, how far away from a cathartic moment are we? How far away from this market finding a clearing price do you think we are? Sure. If we, if we do effectively go into recession, we could see an additional 10 percent downside in equity markets. And I think that would be interesting to start to add positions and, and, and use that cash um, that we have accumulated on the sidelines. Um, but I think there's more interest, for me at least, in the fixed income market. Um, so we have the 10-year yields, two-year yields flying, you know, the long end. Yields are becoming attractive. Um, so if we see the 10-year, for example, go to four, that's attractive. And I think the long end of the Treasury curve could serve as a nice hedge to risk assets mm -hmm. um, at these levels. So I would start to accumulate. And I think that fixed income, as guy, we move away from everyone talking about inflation, which has been, you know, stagflation is what happened this year. As we move away from talking about inflation, as inflation drops, which it inevitably will, and we talk about recession, the unemployment rate jumping, which is my perspective, I think the unemployment rate is inevitably going to jump. Um, uh, I think fixed income is going to catch a bit, and we need to go out the duration curve uh, and start accumulating in the, in the near term. Hey, Catherine, we just got um, a headline here in the Bloomberg. The yuan fell to the lowest level, uh, the, the lowest closes to the weekend of the PBOC ban since 2015. Just the strong dollar, weak yuan, weak uh, currency story. Um, is there a play in the FX market? The FX market moves have been phenomenal uh, today, fascinating. Um, the dollar uh, has jumped significantly, and that's, of course, because of the, the difference in interest rate differentials, which I don't think is going to go away in the near term. So let's continue to bank on a few things, uh, Alex, and that is a strong dollar for the near term. That is an inverted and increasingly more inverted yield curve. Uh, and I think, uh, I think you're going to get 
um, some uh, attraction on the fixed income front. So, so those I think are the are the near term trends that are going to continue. Uh, the Fed is the place that you know to hide. It, it, I mean, the Fed is going to continue to hike rates. So, Treasury I think are going to catch a bid. Um, that's going to continue to keep pressure on the dollar and on on Treasuries. Uh, which I yeah. suspect we're going to see uh, rates start to drop by the end of this year. Catherine, is this a an equity market that you can ride out the down drop, the down draft, or is this a market you should, rather than trying to ride out, bail out? Should you be getting out right now? Should you be selling? Yeah, I think it's it's tough to liquidate positions right now um, because it's such a volatile environment and you would be realizing some very hefty losses. So I'm not recommending our clients to liquidate their positions right now, but rather take advantage of any bear market rallies like we saw in the month of July um, to readjust portfolios. And I wouldn't be surprised, Guy, if we do get additional bear market rallies uh, over the course of the next six to 12 months. So let's use those times to readjust, not mm -hmm. in the peak of panic, which I think is what we are doing right now. So let's just add one more point, Guy, and I think that is when, when we, historically the equity market does catch a bid and we do see a bit of a rally, when the Fed has, when the market has concluded that the Fed has reached its peak hikes. And I think we've gotten there. Mm -hmm. I don't think if they, they didn't hike 100 basis points this week. They're not going to. Um, November, December could be 75 in November. My suspicion is that they do 50. I, I think the Fed is going to minimize or drop the cuts from here on out because inflation expectations are falling. Mm -hmm. Recession is a very imminent risk. And in, real inflation data is going to start to drop significantly. Um, another headline, Pound extending its declines, briefly trades below 110. I mean, really unbelievable moves. Hey, Catherine, um, when does EM credit and corporate credit start to tank? The, those things haven't fallen out of bed yet with everything yes. else happening. Why and when does it happen? Excellent point, Alex. And this is something I've actually been talking with our institutional clients about for some time. We have not seen that, that wave of defaults or delayed payments in the high yield market or in the EM spectrum, and that's coming. So I would be very cautious on both high yields and emerging market debt. If we're going to be investing in fixed income, I would be looking at investment grade. Yes, it, 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 it yields less, but there is no alternative, is no longer an investing option. Um, so I would say be very careful that is coming. And when it comes, high yield and emerging markets are so inextricably correlated in terms of their price action um, that emerging markets going to take a hit. Um, so I would be very careful with regard to risk assets, especially on the below investment grade front or emerging market front. Catherine, always great to catch up. Thank you for the analysis on what is a, uh, an interesting day, which is part of an interesting week. Catherine Rooney-Vera of Baltic, thank you very much indeed. As we've been speaking, KKR and investor lesser going out today. A note to investors, the strategists there see a mild 2023 recession and a risk, and the risk, Alex, of a Fed overshoot. Um, it, it is certainly something that the market is now actively considering. How far will the Fed go? How much further will the Fed go uh, than what is necessary? And how much damage potentially could that cause? That may be already being realized mm -hmm. here in the UK. Still ahead, the UK announcing its biggest tax cuts since 1972. I can't really remember that. Maybe just. It's triggering a market meltdown, as you can see on the screen. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Mercedes has begun stockpiling parts it makes using natural gas. That will keep production going for several weeks, even if Germany introduces drastic fuel rationing. Mercedes is building up supplies at factories in the US and China in case its German facilities have to go offline. Airbus is reaffirming its production targets, even though supply chain problems limit its ability to deliver jetliners on schedule. CEO Guillaume Foray says Airbus is standing by plans to build 75 of its flagship A320 family aircraft by 2025. It's also sticking with a reduced target of 700 deliveries across all of its jetliner models this year. 
and Apple Music will replace Pepsi as the presenter of the Super Bowl halftime show. Pepsi has had its name on the star-studded intermission since 2013. According to Sportico, Apple may have paid as much as $50 million a year for the five-year deal. This year, more than 120 million viewers watched the halftime show. And that is your latest business flash, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So a historic giveaway, the UK government unveiling its biggest tax cut since 1972, UK bonds pound plunging, markets pricing in more aggressive pace of tightening to offset the government's plan. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden has been covering all of this. Uh, she joins us now at what, Westminster. Um, Lizzie, walk us through the parts that the market objected to the most. There was a lot unveiled here. Yes, uh, Alex, well, you've got a raft of tax cuts. Uh, the Chancellor is trying to boost growth. Of course, we had the energy bailout that had already been announced. Uh, but the reason that this is such an economic gamble is, first of all, uh, because markets reckon it's going to add to inflation. That's why traders are now pricing for 100 basis points from the Bank of England in November. Secondly, it's clearly going to necessitate a lot of borrowing. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says uh, while it's going to add to borrowing, it won't necessarily... Uh, stimulate growth significantly and as you say it's the biggest raft of tax cuts since 1972 but they're doing it at a time when borrowing costs are increasing because interest rates are going up but it's also a political gamble uh, this is happening in a cost of living crisis we're two years away from an election not much time for Liz Truss to prove herself to the voters and who in fact did not choose Liz Truss remember the Tory membership chose her and yet because of the tax cuts at the top end, let me read you some analysis from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. If you earn more than £155,000 a year, you win. Earn less, you lose. And if you earn more than a million pounds a year, then you're going to be £40,000 uh, a year better off because of these tax cuts. So, frankly, our audience just got a whole lot richer. Lizzie... They say they don't care about the markets. They say they don't care about the market reaction. Briefly, how long does that last? Uh, well, until the Chancellor realises that it's going to take the market's faith to pay for this. It's, uh, he needs gilts and sterling uh, to, to fund this. You've talked about the kindness of strangers earlier in the programme, uh, that famous Mark Carney phrase. We spoke to Martin Wheel yesterday, former Bank of England policymaker. He says it's not the kindness of strangers, yep. it's the vested interests of strangers. Lizzie, great stuff. Thank you for the coverage. Lizzie Burton down at Westminster. This is Bloomberg. We're about an hour into a very ugly U.S. trading session, but barely off the lows. Volume really high. Bloomberg's Abigail will do a little track in those moves. Abigail? Good point on volume, Alex, because we are uh, well off or well above the 20-day moving average. And this is the week. So to have high volume on the selling that we're seeing today, take a look at what it's relative to the decline of 4.5% on the week, including today. Any way you put it, slice and dice it, it is bearish. That socks, that chip index down even more, down 6%. Crude oil now breaking $80 per barrel. Uh, we, of course, Earlier this year, we're talking about that parabolic uptrend that they typically don't sustain. It has now basically reversed in full back below $80 per barrel, probably with more downside ahead. Crude oil, a risk asset, a sign of global growth, not doing so well today. And of course, the big story, yield, bond selling off, that 10-year yield, two-year yield, both up about 25 basis points on the year, making everything else look more expensive and giving a lot of support, of course, for uh, the dollar. When we take a look at the S&P 500 relative to the Dow Transports, because of course last week we pointed out the fact that the Dow Transports had broken below their June low, it seems very likely that we're going to see that again. In blue, we're looking at the S&P 500 on the year ugly, down 22 percent, now back in a bear market if it ever left it. That Dow Transports, though, down even more, down almost 27 percent. This chart strongly suggests that you will see the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, the Russell 2000, all these big indexes break that June low. If that happens, is it a trap door where where is support below? Uh, I would suggest that technically it's far below, probably somewhere closer to 3,000. That, of course, is a target that Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley has been talking about for quite some time, also talking about it in terms of bringing his earnings estimates in. This is the biggest area of volatility, though. This is really incredible because 
uh, FX currencies, that's the foundational uh, asset class of all. And if you take a look at what's happening on the week for the Bloomberg dollar index up 2%, the Dixie up 2.5%, of course, having more exposure to the euro, showing how much weakness there is for the euro. But then if you also throw in the pound, and of course, we have that plan today uh, that's really going to create, uh, you know, is bringing the, the, the pound down uh, as the government is going to need to borrow and borrow and borrow to support that plan. So I'm talking about parity for uh, the pound. We've already seen that, of course, for the euro. And then this real uh, growth uh, uh, pair, the, uh, the uh, Kiwi versus the yen. This speaks to yen strength in a way that we can't see it against the dollar, down 3.2%. Both of these last two pairs, the worst since March of 2020. That's the kind of risk off. When we put it all together, it's pretty interesting picture, Guy. If we take a look at the VIX, which you would think would be sky high, the VIX relative to the bond index, that move index, and the currency uh, uh, volatility index, this was March of 2020. All were way, way high. So right now we're looking at the move index, interestingly not above its peak. Then we're looking at the currency index, both very high. There's the VIX. It suggests, I would say, and I've been talking to some of the experts on Options Insight about this, that we may have some more volatility ahead for stocks. Certainly feels like there's the potential for some bumpiness. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's continue the conversation about what's happening over here in Europe in a little bit more detail. Uh, we got the PMI data out a little bit earlier on. To be honest, the day didn't start particularly well and has progressively got worse. So we've had activity uh, out for the Eurozone. Uh, we've got activity out for the UK. We've got individual country data that we need to be focusing in, as, in, in on as well. Um, but basically, the, the takeaway, private activity in the, in the Eurozone contracted for a third month. Um, obviously, this is driven by inflation, record inflation, uh, and it, it's certainly having an impact in terms of the data. This is what we've seen today. So top line August, bottom line September. France actually looking relatively OK, but elsewhere, Germany. Germany is really being hit hard by what we're seeing with the energy crisis here in Europe. 46.9 to 45.9. These are the comp numbers. The Eurozone, that had a big, big effect on the Eurozone numbers. 48.9 down to 48.2. And then you look at the UK, 49.6 down to 48.4. These, these feel like recessionary numbers and certainly appear to portend uh, some very significant economic slowdowns. You wonder uh, what the, uh, the October data are going to look like, particularly after the turbulence we're seeing now. Let's get an idea of what is happening here. Chris Williamson, of course, is the man to ask. Uh, he is the IHS market chief business economist putting together all of the data that we're looking at here on the screen. Chris, let's start off with the UK because that seems to be the epicentre of the action today. When I look at the PMI data, when I look at what has just been announced with the Chancellor, by the Chancellor, uh, and look at the market reaction to it, is this an economy that if it's not in recession is certainly imminently heading for one? I go, yeah, it looks like it's already in one. You had uh, falling GDP in the second quarter and the PMI data have deteriorated further in the, in the third quarter. And the forward-looking indicators suggest it's going to get worse in the closing quarter of the year. So we're very much in recession at the moment, it seems, albeit only mild. But nevertheless, uh, you know, everything's turning into the uh, a more southerly direction when you look at business confidence, when you look at ordering flows, as well as that headline activity numbers. Um, it's definitely a contractionary picture that we've got in the UK at the moment. Um, so for the UK and Europe, are the same things moving it? Is it an inflation story? Is it a demand story? Or is it about, uh, is it a production story? It is first and foremost an inflation story with the rising cost of living, obviously linked to the energy price. Um, that's, that's destroying demand now. So there, you've got two pressures on business. One is the rising cost, which they're trying to absorb. Um, that's leading to a lack of investment in capacity. In many cases, they're continuing to take on workers because obviously that's cheaper than investing. This is a, um, a trend that we've been seeing throughout the year so far. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, you're getting demand destruction come through now. There's some alleviation of capacity constraints, which is helping at least ease the rate of decline, most notably in Germany. We saw the manufacturing output numbers, they're still in decline, but not as bad as they were. And a lot of that's linked to the actual material supply chains improving. But on top of that now, you've got the energy price coming through, which is causing some producers to curb activity, to, to not run their, their production lines as much as they were to save those costs, uh, especially in the face of 
the number of customer inquiries and new sales they're getting is starting to come down. Mm. So they're saying it's all very well. We might have the semiconductors or whatever it is we've been lacking. But now what's that final demand doing? Do we really need to be producing all of these units? Chris, when you look at the data historically, what is the nearest analog to what we're looking at here? The nearest analog? Yeah. So, um, sorry, Guy, in what context? What do you mean? Well, so what, what is the nearest comparison? If you look back in history and look at previous downturns, previous experiences with high inflation, what, what, I, what, does, the, what does the data you're looking at tell us? Is, is, are, is there anything previously in history that is useful to take away? I'm just trying to get a sense of how investors should mm. be thinking about this, contextualising what we're seeing here in Europe. Is there something that is a useful point of comparison? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I don't think there is, you know, because you've got so many different things going on. Obviously, everything's coming off the back of, of the, um, the pandemic at a time when you still got the remnants from the global financial crisis with historically low interest rates. You know, if you were to go back 20 odd years and say, well, they're going to be hiking interest rates to 4%, we'd have all gone, yeah, so big deal. You know, that's that's nothing to worry about. But in the context of what we've seen since the global financial crisis, that is a big deal because everybody's been setting their borrowing requirements and rep repayment needs on the basis of ultra low interest rates. And they're starting to go up and that's starting to hurt mm -hmm. much more than it would have in the past. At the same time, you've still got the big supply issues, those and, and, and um, the energy shock. So there's so many things that you can take individually, maybe a bit of context from from history, but put, it, put them all together and you've got quite a unique environment, which is why the markets are struggling so much. Um, Chris, turning to the US, honestly, it feels like a different world. The preliminary read that you guys released today, you're looking at 49.2 uh, for the services, the composites 49.3, manufacturing's over 51. They're all better than expected and they're all rising from the previous month. Can the U.S. stay this strong when the data in the U.K. and Europe gets worse? It's going to be interesting to see, isn't it? Because this will be a very unusual time in which a global recession is potentially led by Germany, possibly. And the resilience of the U.S. is, is nice to see. It's, you know, treat it carefully, because when you look at these numbers, Q3 as a whole for the U.S., is weaker than Q2. It's looked like it's still in contractionary territory, despite the numbers coming up, especially in services compared to August. What we're seeing there is some alleviation of the, the, the price squeeze and those supply constraints starting to help lift production and, and business activity. It, but, but the divergence with Europe is getting quite, quite marked now. In terms of overall input costs across manufacturing and services, You've got a 10 point difference really between the US uh, input cost gauge and that, that in Europe now, both the US and uh, the Eurozone and UK. So the US inflationary pressures are coming down really quite markedly now, like as we would have expected. But in, in Europe, signs of them ticking up again, most notably in the Eurozone as those high energy prices come through. Now, a big thing will be how governments deal with this. France, we've got some better data than in Germany, especially in the service sectors, you've got more. Um, help from the government in terms of households and getting through this this energy squeeze. Uh, that, yep. that that fiscal side is going to be very important for Europe. Just looking at the UK and thinking about the UK today, Chris, you've studied the UK for, for a long time. If inflation is the threat, does fiscal policy become counterproductive if it if it supports any inflationary impulse that is already in the economy? Sure, it does. Yeah. Um, hmm. the, it, we're getting increasingly worried about the UK, uh, both from its near term economic data that we're seeing through the PMI, uh, the, the speed with which the demand side and the output numbers are coming down and the persistence of the elevated inflationary signals we're getting in the UK. Big contrast to the US, for example. Um, but combined with this push and pull you're going to get uh, between fiscal and monetary policy, uh, everything that we've heard today is is going to stoke that little bit more um, of the interest rate hike from the Bank of England. They're, go they're really going to have to work hard over the next year um, if this fiscal policy push does lift demand 
um, it, it's surely going to lead to ever high interest rates. And that's why we've got market pricing in more and more rate hikes uh, from the Bank of England. Oof, brutal, 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 brutal. Chris, thanks a lot. Chris Williamson, IHS Market Chief Business Economist. Thank you so much for joining us and for your flexibility. It's always good to see you. All right, coming up, you got a food shortage crisis and what it takes to move crops around the world. It's a key part to the inflation narrative. We're going to talk to Cargill's Ocean Transportation President coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. In Ukraine, voting starts today in four Russian-occupied territories on whether to join Russia. Ukraine and its allies have blasted the votes as shams. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said, quote, we will not allow President Putin to get away with it. And the price of wheat has hit a two-month high. Traders fear that Vladimir Putin's move to escalate his war in Ukraine will pose a threat to grain supply from the Black Sea. There's concern that an agreement to allow the resumption of Ukrainian grain shipments could be at risk. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Ritika. Staying with that theme, President Biden addressed the U.N. General Assembly this week. And among the issues he highlighted is global food insecurity as Russia's invasion of Ukraine heightens fears of shortages. We're calling on all countries to refrain from banning food exports or hoarding grain while so many people are suffering. Because in every country in the world, no matter what else divides us, if parents cannot feed their children, nothing, nothing else matters. Let's get the view on the ground from someone responsible for transporting food and other products all around the world. Jan Dieleman is the president of Cargill Ocean Transportation. Cargill is one of the largest, world's largest agricultural companies. Um, Jan, good, this is so important to get this perspective. As of now, give us insight. Are Ukrainian export corridors open right now to get grains out? Is that working? Uh, hi, Aaron. Thanks, Alex, for having me. Uh, yes, actually, the, uh, the food is moving out of the Ukraine. Uh, the corridors are moving. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it actually moved a little bit smoother than we initially uh, expected. I think they counted about 4 million tons that has left the area right now. Um, but, yeah, always the question is, what is next? What do you think is next? What are you preparing for? Well, it, it's, it's, it's all geopolitics at the moment, right? So uh, we're living by the day in that sense, in that specific area. In the rest of the world, uh, things are running relatively smoothly. So that is absolutely something that is the case. Uh, but that's an area where uh, it's, it's very difficult. There's mm -hmm. no crystal ball uh, if politics are involved, unfortunately. No, and things are going to get worse, right? We get the uh, December 5th. You got uh, Europe is going to be banning uh, oil um, uh, imports from Russia. There's also the worries about a gas price cap and oil price cap. Are you seeing any repercussions or any future planning based on these sanctions and restrictions? Yeah, the market has, has clearly been preparing for this. Uh, we see more coal flows, for instance, into Europe from, from different destinations and, and origins. So that, that is clearly happening. Uh, what we also see is because of the higher prices in Europe, we are seeing some industry dialing back or actually sometimes even shutting, uh, which is clearly having impact on flows. And you can see that in rates in, in dry bulk, which have actually come off over the last couple of weeks. Jan, we've been debating this all week. I'd be curious to get your answer. How fast is the global economy slowing right now? I think it's relatively fast, to be honest with you. And it's a little bit depending on what region you're, you're looking at. But Europe is clearly, uh, you can see it, it is, it is happening. Uh, but also around China, we can see a lot less movement. Uh, there's a lot less congestion. So supply chains are, are easing there as well. In other parts of the world, this may be a little bit less obvious. But in those two areas, we can clearly see it on the demand base. Uh, I wonder, Jan, if we understand what is driving that demand weakness, right? I mean, in China, it still feels like it's a lockdown story, whereas in Europe, it feels like it's a high energy price story. And then you have uh, industry starting to have to shut down and reduce their demand on things like fertilizer. Do you have insight into which is what? Yeah, no, I think I think it's basically both, to be honest with you. So I I think in China, there's indeed uh, some of the lockdown uh, still the overhang, I would, would call it. So that's clearly the case. Uh, but also industrial production is not going full speed there either. So uh, 
if you look at, at Europe, it is clearly the energy prices, I think, that are, are doing the work that industry is actually uh, producing less. And we'll see where this goes. But uh, we clearly seen a step down in, uh, in movements across the world. Jan, what, what impact will a higher cost of capital, higher rates have on the shipping industry? Short term, I think um, purely from the shipping perspective, I don't think it, it's, it's making a huge difference. Uh, what you will see, of course, if you look a little bit further down the road, then uh, replacement values for ships are going to be up. So I, I think you will see a bit of a slowdown in ordering, uh, which is probably not a bad thing, given what you're seeing in the nearby markets today. Uh, but it's not normally that if you have a 1% increase that all of a sudden you see massive drop off in, in commodity movements. Um, another part of this has been, and this is a broader conversation of how, how you have energy security but also go green at the same time. And can you do both at the same time? Um, from your perspective, from having to ship stuff around the world, what's the answer to that question, which I feel like is a structural issue, not a cyclical one? No, and I think this is what we're debating here at the conference that I'm at. And I think you need to divide a little bit between what's happening in the short term. And there is a crisis, right? There's a food crisis, there's an energy crisis, and, and that is just what it is. And we'll need yeah. to deal with that. And, and probably that is not helping the greening of the industry in the short term. Having said that, I think what you especially see in Europe, there's a big drive for energy independence, which is probably going to increase the speed of the energy transition. So I think short term, there's clearly headwinds. But I can see medium longer term that this green trend, this decarbonization of the sector yeah. is still a very, very big topic. But, but if we're not ordering new ships, if the industry is not ordering new ships because of higher rates, the higher cost of capital and maybe a slowing market as well, does that slow the transition down? Or is, is it something that simply happens with refits, uh, with different technology being applied to, to, to older vessels? How does, how does the, the slowing of the industry affect the transition? Yeah, well, the, the problem that we've had in this industry is that we didn't have an awful lot of uh, solutions, right? It's, it's called the hard to abate industry for a reason. Um, so there's been hard work done over the last couple of years to actually get the, uh, the me mechanical and the technical side done. So people have been working on, on getting the engines for the zero carbon fuels that we actually need to really get to the commitments that we're all making. And so that is happening and, and that starts to come a little bit closer to reality. Uh, so people start ordering these type of ships. So I think that will continue. Uh, but on the short uh, term, so what can you do in the nearby? There's a lot of things you can do around supply chain uh, optimization. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things you can do with energy saving devices, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some more regulation coming in as well, which is going to slow down uh, the fleet. Uh, so there is clearly a mix of, of short-term measures and, and longer-term kind of opportunities to, to get to these goals. Uh, Jan, I, I don't envy the job that you have right now. And I'm just wondering, before we let you go, what is your visibility like over the next 6 to 12 months in terms of what's going to be moved and the demand? How far out can you really see right now? Well, I think the reality today is that a lot of the markets are not uh, led by supply and demand analysis like you usually used to have. And the, the visibility, I think, that we have as well is a lot less uh, going forward. So I think you need to plan just a little bit shorter. You need to be agile. Um, and we just need to see how this all goes. But uh, it's, it's very dynamic. It's in flux. It basically means you need to remain on your toes. Jan Dilleman. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thanks for joining us from the conference, President of Cargill's Ocean Transportation Business uh, and the Chair of the Global Maritime Forum. This is Bloomberg. I don't think I really need to speak at this point. Maybe people would argue that is probably a good long-term trend. But uh, the numbers here in the UK kind of speak for themselves. They're ugly. They're uniformly ugly. Let's start with the pound. Let's start with the cable rate. Moments ago, we had a 108 handle. It was brief, but we are now trading pretty close to that as well. 109.05. We're down by over 3%. Down and down fairly sharply, following what we heard from the Chancellor a little bit earlier on. The PMI data weren't great either. Let's take a look at the five-year. The, the five-year is up by 45 basis points today. The, the Bank of England has basically been pushed into, into a much more aggressive rate cut here. The market's now pricing 100 basis points of hikes. But this is an economy that could slow rapidly with these kinds of movements. Uh, and then you've got the FTSE 250 down by 1.9% today. The, the numbers speak for themselves. 
Up next, we're going to get another voice, though, into the mix. Ray Newton-Smith is the chief economist uh, over at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. We'll get a view from the CBI next. How is business thinking about what was just announced? We'll find out next. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.